So before the uh, presentation, Jay uh, Konatowski, I'll uh, give you some background information about the, this research. Oh, yeah. this Since because uh, in Japan, in the unstable period of political national government of the Democratic Party era from 2009 to last year, there's the, a the long history of the Democrat, liberal Democrat Party era, so about 50 years. And these 10 years, the national governance government system is now very unstable. And of course, also there's an, another local government mayor's uh, presence is now a bit stronger, especially for Tokyo and Osaka. And uh, the mayor Ishihara in Tokyo and mayor uh, Hashimoto in Osaka is a very uh, well, well heard famous politicians who address their very aggressive, aggressive uh, addressment to the, not only Japan, but also the, some of the prosecute issues in the US and Japan. And uh, that, that inference, uh, we are working in also the city university, the city funded university, so we are now very uh, under the uh, political and administrative restructuring period. So. Uh, we are now in a tamed animals to follow the mayor's <laughs> uh, addressments. Uh, uh, this is some as joke. But we are uh, <laughs> focused on very evidence-based research we are now pursue because we are contributed to the uh, the strong Osaka. The, the mayor of our uh, Osaka is very pursued, so that's slogan. Uh, but I, I'm a, well, I, uh, we are critical geographer, so I'm not just followed her. In his investment, but we have today's uh, 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 talk is about to how to the alternative urban regeneration uh, uh, programs uh, we are now pursuing. So uh, tomorrow, the, the another graduate student, uh, Johannes, has some introduced them. And so please uh, enjoy the, our teams, uh, research teams, to the, some renovations uh, projects to the following app. So please, let's start. The OK. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, today's talk, I'll, I want to give like a different light on uh, the type of gentrification I've been uh, talking about. and. Uh, I actually chose this picture. I'll be talking about this area. Uh, the area is called uh, Nishinari. It's the northern part of Nishinari. And Nishinari is the, basically the poorest district within Osaka. It's an inner city area. And uh, I will show you, I will give you many statistics, what are the problems there. But first of all, I want to show you this picture because it kind of depicts what are the problems just by the landscape of it. Uh, as you can see, there's this like open land and there are many places like that uh, within the area then you see very old housing and in the background you see public housing and the thing is these vacant lands have been there for more than 10 years now right Toshio? i think more than 10 years now and there's not not any capital coming in basically so i'm not sure whether to look at this as a uh, what uh, anna discussed as a, like a thing of de-investment uh, or, or whether there's something else at play. Um, what I want to talk about first is uh, basically what is social justice about and, and for who, actually. I, I think we should always ask ourselves, if you talk about social justice, uh, for who are you uh, talking about? And uh, I try to give like a very simple um, Definition, definition of it as uh, social justice being about fairness and equality of opportunity. It, it's not my definition, it's uh, from Patterson. And um, I guess you can extend this, what, what Wing Xing said, that it's a problem of collective values against private property and uh, how that plays out against each other. Um, I'll also try to put a face on social justice. Actually, Jackie did that as well by addressing the elderly problem so I think it's important about you get an image about uh, for who are you advocating social justice I'm gonna try to uh, define it also as a demographic issue because if when we talk about gentrification we always talk about uh, economical terms like brand gap and uh, you know how capital uses uh, space 
in order to circulate through. But I'm not going to... I'm going to look at this from another way. I'm not going to look at this as a circulation of capital, but as a circulation of people. And how this circulation is actually being uh, realized by policy or by grassroots uh, movement. So the outline of, my, uh, prison, of our presentation is uh, very simple. First, I'll be talking about the changes in the housing landscape of Nishinara. So first, you get an idea uh, what the area is all about. Then I'll try to put the issue into the framework of, of social mixing and, gentrific and gentrification. Uh, and then finally, I'll present our survey on guest houses and how we try to situate uh, what is happening now, because we, we have a big increase of guest houses now in Nishinari and how this may fit within the social mix concept or even within the gentrification concept. Uh, I think the thing we most are, like the biggest problem we are facing now in Japan and especially in Nishinari is uh, the amount of vacant housing. There's a lot of uh, housing stock vacant uh, numbers. These are for uh, Japan nationwide. Uh, it's amounting to more than 13% now. And if you break it down even more into a smaller scale, You'll see that in Osaka we have a vacancy rate of 14% and in Nishinai 20%. That's actually uh, quite a big number. So one problem is, and this is also a problem for Osaka, Osaka City, uh, Osaka, the city itself, is how to manage this vacant housing stock, especially thinking that we do have poverty issues, we do have homeless issues. It kind of seems strange. We have this big amount of uh, vacant housing stock available. Um, so one thing is uh, the vacant uh, housing stock. The other thing is, and, and Nishinari is located right here. This is actually the what we call the Japanese railway loop line. It, within the loop line you have uh, Osaka's uh, city center. Just outside the loop line is actually what you would call uh, the inner city of Osaka and especially here. This is the Nishinari district. Um, yeah, what you will also see is here is like a high rate of, of elderly, elderly people. And it also overlaps with the fact that it's a very densely, uh, it's a crowded, they call it crowded city area. What it means is it has a lot of small roads, a lot of old housing, packed housing. And uh, the problem is, I'll, I'll show you some picture. This is, these are basically the picture. There's a lot of wooden housing there, wooden housing from before the war, which uh, wasn't destructed during the World War bombings. But the problem is these are very uh, dangerous in a sense that if it catches a fire, and a lot of these do, actually, uh, they get burned out quite fast, especially because of, you can see the small rows here. No fire truck can pass through, no ambulance can pass through, so it's, it's quite difficult to manage these areas. And, uh, the idea is to actually, what they call, regenerate, revitalize this area and to uh, widen the roads, etc. But because it's such a big scale, it will take a long time to uh, accomplish this. Uh, these are some other statistics. The, the uh, first part is for Japan nationwide, then you have Osaka City, then you have Nishinari. It's the same uh, for this. Uh, you can see for just the Nishinari district that we have a quite fast aging rate. Also, the rate of housing below dwelling standard, it, this is predominantly because of the wooden housing, is also quite high, especially if you compare it to the city and, and, and nationwide. But I guess the most interest, interesting uh, data here is, is, is this one. It, it shows the amount of elderly, and it shows the amount of, of, of elderly couples and elderly singletons. Now you can see that for nationwide it's, it's kind of a 50-50 thing, but in Nishinari you have like a very big amount of, of, of single elderly uh, living there. And finally, because of, uh, it is an inner city area, we do have a lot of unemployment there. And we do have a lot, uh, on, the other than, on the other hand, we have a lot of uh, what we call livelihood assistance, it's, it's welfare basically. So compared, especially nationwide, I think it's the area with the highest concentration of welfare uh, recipients within Japan. So 
as you can see, there's a lot of, from, from these statistics, there's a lot of issues around in uh, Nishinari. And even if you want to um, project it in future terms, uh, this is here, percent of the elderly, we're around 30 now, but eventually within 20 years this will uh, increase up until almost 50% of the total, uh, of the total population within Nishinari. <laughs> elderly means 65 to 65. 2035. Oh, no. How old is yeah, yeah, 65, sorry. Um, so the fact of the, that we have these kind of conditions, what we also see is that there is a, a big increase within the, uh, within the housing landscape. I'm just showing these pictures to you. Um, here you can see again, there are a lot of wooden tenements still around, uh, especially this green area, which is part of the northern part of Nishinari. Here is where the daily labor market is of uh, Osaka. And, um, but as there are not so many jobs around anymore, and because the, the original labor, daily labor force has been aging as well, you see a shift now from a labor town into a basically a, a welfare recipient town. And you can all the dots here uh, they mean they, they signify housing, which is actually built for people who are on um, who are on, on welfare. Because if you're on welfare in Japan, you also get a housing allowance. And actually, the local housing market tries to pick in uh, on that and, and use that as a form of income. Uh, another thing is that the rooms themselves are also uh, quite small. And, and half of them are what, uh, what they call substandard housing in terms of size and in terms of facilities. That rooms don't have their own toilet, they don't have their own uh, shower room, and, and so on. Uh, another thing is, even if we talk about an increase in welfare recipients, uh, what this shows is that actually there's a quite big amount of people who weren't connected to the daily labor market. The daily labor market would be here, and this also explains why you have such uh, high numbers of people on housing allowance, people on welfare. But the interesting thing is, uh, when you go for further into the northern area, is that you actually have a a big amount of people who weren't related uh, to Irene as the daily labor market. And also who weren't related to former rough sleeping. They were homeless in the sense that they didn't have stable housing, but they didn't actually um, experience rough sleeping uh, before they got on welfare. So I, I just showing this that there's a lot of elderly singletons coming in into these areas which weren't actually uh, related to the area. Uh, as we would have, like, say, 20 years ago. Uh, these are just some illustrations about the uh, housing environment. Uh, the interesting thing would be this. It's, it says the rent. And the rent is set on, uh, let's say, in US dollars, it would be around 4,000 a month. And this is actually the maximum amount of benefit of housing allowance a person on welfare uh, could get. So people running this type of housing, they would also, they would always seek the maximum, you know, of the housing allowance because it comes uh, from, yeah, from the city budget, welfare budget, anyway. Uh, within the daily labor market, uh, the daily labor area uh, as well, we have former SROs because daily laborers are aging, less and less uh, daily laborers are coming in. There's a problem of flop houses of SRO, SRO single room occupancy owners who lost their clientele, basically. And they're also trying to make the switch from uh, a flop house which charges on a daily uh, basis to actually one room apartments. But as you can see, the, these are quite small and for them it's impossible to, um, to try to get the maximum of housing allowance. So, this type of housing would be around, let's say, 2,800 uh, US dollars per month. 200? Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and then this it was uh, 400 a month. Oh, yeah, I got my calculations wrong. Um, 
Another thing they're doing, uh, because I mentioned about the vacancy rate we have, is that they now uh, renovate old housing. Uh, these are row housing. They used to be like a, a row of houses uh, connected to each other, and they just cut out parts of the housing, and they re renovate them into uh, actually apartments, uh, single room apartments for welfare recipients. And you can immediately identify these houses when you see, there's only one entrance, but you can see there are two gas meters, which means there are two rooms uh, in there. So it's actually uh, former private housing, which is being subdivided, in a sense, into um, uh, rooms for uh, single people. These are also just some illustrations. It's interesting. You, you got a lot of forms. It's, it's a little bit dark, but when you open a door of these houses, <laughs> you immediately see a uh, staircase going up. And yeah, a, lo uh, a lot of them are also not quite uh, according to uh, construction and regulation, but this is well, how the, the market is evolving at the moment. Okay, um, just another illustration. This used to be a two floor tenement house, but because uh, a lot of uh, welfare recipients are elderly people and they cannot stand too much noise, the, the private owners, they would uh, rebuild the housing and cut the second floor off just in order to attract uh, people on social welfare. Uh, yeah, wooden apartments also being renovated. The problem is they cannot rebuild because if you want to rebuild, uh, if you want to rebuild it from scratch, the road has to be wider than four meter. But within Nishinari, you have a lot of roads which are smaller than four meter, and which means that you can actually do these kinds of uh, renovations. You cannot uh, rebuild from scratch. Interesting thing is when, when they build stairs, is they don't build a straight stair to the second floor because there are many elderly, they might fall down from the stairs. So if they fall down, they, they, they have like a buffer in between <laughs> kind of thing. And this is how it looks. It, this is a before after thing. So vacant housing, a lot of it is also dilapidated housing. And uh, real estate agents would go in and, and renovate it in this style. So it actually upgrades the housing uh, landscape in a sense. And another thing I will be talking about this later is now that they're been uh, doing reno renovations of former housing, not just uh, houses, also shops, uh, all types of constructions into guest houses. Okay, but still we're stuck with these kind of issues, uh, which is we, we do have a high rate in the scenario of welfare recipients. There is. What, we, uh, what you would call a poverty problem there. You have fire safety because of the small roads and the fact that fire trucks cannot pass through. And then you have the high aging rate. A lot of, uh, of the population there is, is aging fast and most of the population are becoming elderly persons now, especially single elderly persons. Which means that this place in a sense needs some form of policy in order to uh, to counter these uh, tendencies. And what the official policy, this is Osaka city uh, policy, but it's, it's not only the city. You have also a lot of uh, NGOs or corporation who are, uh, who are think, thinking of the same thing is that they want to attract young couples into the area. If they attract young couples, the area would revitalize and everything would become you know, better. And uh, what they do is uh, the city is thinking now of, of giving tax incentives, uh, tax benefits to younger uh, couples. Which brings me to uh, my more theoretical framework, and this is about social mixing. Because actually what we're think what the uh, city is thinking about and what a lot of corporations and NGOs are thinking about is uh, social mixing. But uh, th there's a lot of, even within geography and within uh, uh, gentrification research, there's a lot of criticism now against the uh, practice of mixed community. Uh, most of the critique would go that recent slogans of urban rene uh, rene regeneration, urban renaissance, neighborhood revitalization, you have many terms like that, actually just come down to the fact that they want to gentrify the area. But because gentrification has such a bad connotation, they would use other uh, slogans like uh, revitalization. 
and uh, of course the purpose is then to give uh, to create a buffer against prolonged uh, or increasing social degradation and to give incentives for social uh, mobility and I guess this is the interesting part of it how they uh, define how they conceptualize uh, social mobility um, this is not related to the yeah I'm, I'm mostly using uh, I'm mostly talking about uh, this book. It's called Gentrification by Stealth. It's the fact that they use different slogans, but eventually the result it would, uh, would be gentrification. Uh, it's, it, I guess it came out last year. Uh, also, Loretta Lee's uh, is in there. Um, this is not related to the book. I've been looking into some other works, what, what the original meaning of social mix is, and I found it interesting. Uh, to know that it's actually already been used after the industrial uh, revolution when they were actually when, when the city was trying to manage their labor uh, housing areas is that they used it as a, a form of a social buffer especially to counter uh, movements, rights movements uh, of the laborers themselves uh, you still see this social buffer in the form of uh, managing concentrations of poverty now you also see it used as a, a what I would call a cultural buffer. If you import the middle class, you're importing role models. If you import role models, people would have somebody to look up to and eventually try to become like them. The third one would be an uh, economic buffer. Uh, the argument goes that if the middle class comes in, they provide labor opportunities or they provide uh, information to get into certain new parts of the labor market. And the last one would be the fiscal buffer, and I guess this is uh, very much used now uh, in Europe, and I guess maybe also in America, is the fiscal buffer. Because if, if the middle class goes out the city, what happens is that the city loses its uh, fiscal basis. So these are actually the historical background why social uh, mixing has been uh, used. Now the critique, critique against social mixing is that even if you want to manage poverty, even if you, uh, you know, want to revitalize the area, what happens, and this is more of an empirical critique, is that in most uh, cases you get a displacement of low income people because the middle class is moving in, rents would rise, and the if eventual result would be that many of the low income class will be displaced. Another interesting thing is that although you're creating a mix, people are not mixing. It's, it's difficult, you know, if you import uh, middle income class people, that they would actually start communicating, start mixing with lower classes people. You don't see that very often. And even when you want to uh, implement social mixing, there are no clear parameters of how much middle class you need in order for, you know, for a area uh, to become better. Uh, another critique would be it's a one-sided strategy. You never hear that, uh, you never hear social mixing as a means of putting low income people into a higher class income area. You never hear this. Although there have been some attempts at this, uh, but they have all failed. It, it connects to the NIMBY syndrome. Um, the fifth is the loss of local benefits, and I will, will talk about this in a minute. Uh, you also have actually benefits of segregation, and this could be that there is a high, uh, that you have a lot of resources, social resources, which are, can be used for the poor, and because it's a poor area. If the middle class come in, not many middle class would want to have a shelter in their area. Not many, many middle class would want to identify their area. Uh, with, a, with a place that provides uh, special services for the poor. And then, uh, finally, disciplining into good consumers. It disconnects to the role model uh, thing, I guess. It's that you know, poor people, they don't know how to consume. When you bring in the middle class people, they'll show uh, them how to consume according to their own uh, resources. So the critique goes that its social mixing uh, concept is actually a very uncritical deployment. And, but why it is being used is that because social mix, nobody has really ever complained to social mix as a bad thing. It always have, has had a good connotation. 
but if you look at it empirically, if you look at what it is uh, producing, is that it's, it's not giving us uh, many uh, the results that we have hoped for. And I found this also interesting. This sense, it also comes from the book is that it hasn't create social mixing hasn't created in many cases any greater social mobility for the urban poor, nor to urban social justice. Uh, the critique goes on as being a face-based policy because there's no real empirical evidence that uh, social mixing would work. Uh, I think the, uh, the eighth one is also very important is because when you talk about social mixing, you wouldn't address structural problems, why there is poverty. You know, It kind of also gives a, an excuse not to deal with the fact why poverty is uh, produced. It just gives incentives to manage poverty. And then lastly is, uh, yeah, last critique goes now that it, social mixing is actually a cheap way to not invest in areas, just try to bring in the middle class and they'll do everything themselves so it will be very cost effective. But I, I always think it's, it's uh, difficult. I, I tried to set up a, a simple um, table here about the complication of social mix. So what we're talking about is that social mix isn't working. But then you have the problem of segregation. Segregation could work if there is a lot of investment in the area, but if there isn't, you'll have a poverty problem, you have ghetto problem. You know, it, it, they're just, it's, it's, I, I guess it's very difficult to draw the line what can work. If you work with social mix, you might get gentrification. If you stay with segregation, you might get dilapidation. You know, if you go for social mix, you might get displacement. Uh, which is a problem, but on the other hand, if you work with segregation, you need a lot of welfare uh, there in order for to, uh, in order for that place to make it work. And so, what actually should be addressed, and this is where uh, our work comes in, is that you know it's, it shouldn't be much about bringing in the middle class and let them, letting the middle class do their thing. It should be you know that more structural economic conditions should be addressed and that employment should be created or that upward social mobility would be created. Uh, you know, market processes, they haven't been working up until now. And even if you uh, do social mixing, you just cannot uh, initiate it and, and let it go as it is. It would actually need continuous support in order for, to, for it to make it work. Yet what I have a problem is with, if you look at the elderly problem we have in Osaka, it's not a problem about employment. They're 65 years old, they're actually retired. In a sense, it's not really about bringing them back into the labor market. Another thing is the upward social uh, mobility. Uh, you know, how would a uh, single elderly people on welfare be expected to, to socially mobilize himself? Market processes, when we look uh, in Nishinari, there is actually market processes who are working, who are providing uh, houses. Uh, for the poor people. So these, these were things that I felt a, a little bit uh, uncomfortable with. The, the only thing I agree is that it needs continued support. So yeah, these are the questions then. What about places with a high concentration of elderly people? And I don't, I don't think I need to explain to you if you have places with high concentration of elderly people is that the, the area would, uh, would experience degradation because if, if more elderly people come in the city, they use taxes, they don't provide taxes, okay? If the city wants to cut down on their taxes, where are they gonna cut you know, the number of buses or whatever? It's in these kind of places. So what you, have, what you eventually will have is a, uh, is a lower living standard if you just uh, let uh, areas with high concentration of elderly people as they are. And another thing is about stigmatization, which we have in Nishinari a lot. Uh, it, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what we should do about stigmatization. There's a lot of stigmatization against Nishinari. There's a lot of uh, bad images about there, a lot of discrimination as well. But it's because there is stigmatization and, and, and discrimination that it is an area which can you know, cater for the poor in reality. Um, then what we were thinking is, okay, so if social mixing wouldn't work economically, then maybe if you have a problem with an elderly area is to bring in younger people. And younger people not 
like new middle class people, uh, younger people who also don't have that much of economical resources and which uh, wouldn't give all the incentives you know, for an uh, area to gentrify. Uh, the Nishinari Special District is what, what Toshio has been talking about. Uh, Osaka is now under uh, reconstruction. They're trying to make Osaka a metropolitan area now. And the start of the metropolitan area would be Nishinari. They consider it to be the central pin, you know, like in bowling. If you hit the central pin, everything falls, which means that the whole of Osaka would be, become better if you can address Nishinari in a proper way. Okay, but we've been doing this guest house survey uh, for two reasons. One is because there has been an increase in guest houses, but also because there are many real estate uh, agencies, and a lot of them, and, but they're mostly small, very small scale uh, agencies, who have been trying to do something for the area to regenerate the area in their own ways. And I've just taken it from their uh, website and I've, I've translated it. The slogan goes to co-create a healthy community. Of course, they, they look from it as a business point of view. They, they want to have their income. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not trying to, uh, um, I, I also realize it, but still, the, the interesting thing is if they don't provide like a, a social network, if they don't have this social idea behind their um, practices is that they cannot get their clientele to survive. So it's, yeah, it's a strange thing uh, to look at it, but it has been affected uh, within the area. And there is now a new housing market, which is not the common, the general housing market, the general uh, rental market as before, but actually a kind of rental system which, which takes care for people on welfare, not just on welfare, for poor people as well, which uh, makes the housing more accessible uh, for those people. And then, yeah, we have been looking at uh, what the same real, uh, real estate agencies are doing now is that they're also uh, renovating parts of housing into uh, guest houses. And the background of that is, uh, yeah, I'll just give you some conditions and terms. It, it comes down to the fact that it's very accessible uh, housing. It's very cheap. Uh, it, it gives incentives to uh, upgrade the area, to use vacant housing in a new way, and to bring in uh, also like a more like more uh, for foreign people and younger people into the area. So what we did is first we, we did a survey of uh, residents within uh, the guest houses and and how they look to the area and what their needs are and how they could connect to the area. Because, you know, even if we say, okay, guest houses might be a good thing within the area, you still don't know what, what the guest house residents are, are thinking of it by themselves. Uh, yeah, I'm well, just going to give you some, uh, some basic ideas about the uh, guest house residents. Uh, I guess the interesting thing is that most of half of them, they come from Taiwan. They're young people. Uh, they have their own ways of, of, of finding these new types of guest houses now. They only need their travel passport and they can stay up for one year. And, and most of them are also coming on working holiday. It's a it's quite new um, trend within Japan that now a lot of younger people are increasing uh, who come on a working holiday visa. Um, how, mu how much more time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Okay, let's see. Um, so yeah, we've, we've been basically uh, asking them, you know, we're uh, trying to get more information about their uh, backgrounds, why they come to Japan, why they come to Osaka, and why they're staying in Nishinari, actually. And uh, what I do want to show you is that what I found most interesting, uh, let's see, this fact that uh, from the 18 people we have interviewed is that and these are coming from Hong Kong, they're coming from Taiwan, they're coming from uh, Korea, and especially those from Taiwan, they, have, they already know about Nishinari, even, even, have, if, even if they haven't been in Osaka yet. And they all have this scary uh, image of Nishinari as being dangerous, scary, uh, dirty. And the interesting thing is they, some of them get their information from the internet, but a lot of them get information from Japanese people living in Taiwan or Hong Kong. And whenever they would say to a Japanese person, I'm going to Osaka, I'm going to Nishinari, they would all say, oh, no, just, <laughs> just quit that. Uh, it's not a good place for you to go. 
Uh, so this was the, 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 the image they had. Why they did eventually come to Nishinari is because we have the cheapest guest houses, basically. It's, it's, it's purely financial incentive for them. Uh, so even if, when, after they come, if we ask them about the area, what do you think about the area? Uh, if we ask about what do you think about local people is, yeah, of course, many elderly people, they would call them strange people. Uh, many homeless people in the area as well. Uh, relating to the neighborhood scape is that, you know, streets are very dark at night. The shopping streets are all abandoned. And I, this is the picture I wanted to use. This used to be a very uh, energetic shopping street, but because the uh, population is aging and because a lot of, you know, people on welfare now, they don't use these kind of uh, streets anymore. So, and, and they call them shutter streets because you see more uh, shops now with their shutters uh, down. And, but also the people staying in the guest house, they don't use these areas. They go to uh, chain, uh, chain stores, supermarkets uh, to buy uh, their food. So what I wanted to show you is, is it's difficult because they don't connect to the area. They don't hate the area. It's just that they're not interested in, uh, in it and, and they're not using any of their money within uh, the area. Uh, so, yeah, this is basically a quick summary about what we found out from our uh, guest house uh, survey. And I guess the problem is the low interest in the local communities, but there's a great appreciation of, of comfortable location because even if it is a poor area, even if it, is, it has a dangerous uh, image, it's, it's quite comfortably located within. Osaka, you can get to the city center in, in, on bicycle in just five, 15 minutes. There are like three uh, to four train lines there, five stations, I think, in total. So it, it is actually a very uh, comfortable, uh, very advantage, advantageous uh, location. Uh, yeah, what I wanted to conclude is so I don't know how to look at Nishinari as a, as a place of a disinvestment. The, the fact that capital hasn't come in there is because of the stigmatization there. Not, and no, uh, no developer wants to build their new apartments because they're afraid that, you know, Japanese, they, they don't like this area, so people won't move in. That's why they don't invest, okay? They don't see where they can get their profit uh, from. Yet, what you see on the other hand is that the local real estate agents are, um, building new housing there, they're building as in they're doing renovations. They try to address the poverty issue, they try to address uh, the, el the elderly issue. So maybe I was thinking, you know, even if we talk about social justice, and especially in our case, maybe it has to have some kind of demographic character as well. It is important not just to, to you know, uh, look at this as an economical thing, but also as a demographic thing, as you know, younger people getting incentives to move uh, in this area and to counter uh, degradation. Yet, difficult thing is, is will the place actually mix? I have my doubts on that. But uh, still, maybe it's something you know, we can uh, build on and think about uh, for some future, um, yeah, for some uh, options to, uh, to, to help out this area, basically. And yeah, last thing is, you know, this I find, I find the most difficult part, part of it because it is stigmatized on the other hand, it is a spatial safety net. If it wouldn't be stigmatized, you know, probably capital would have come in and, and caused uh, displacement. So I'm not sure how to look at this. Okay, that's it. Uh, what? Oh, okay. Uh, first, first one from. Uh, hi. Uh, I was just uh, uh, thinking when you started that if we uh, looked at uh, the way the, uh, if you think about the sort of data presentation, say from a kind of jacket type of lens or an eye. I was comparing it yeah, to yeah. the earlier presentation. Where, um, uh, because one thing that struck me is that the way um, data or these places are described, it's kind of a, it puts it in a kind of social engineering 
kind of frame mm -hmm. where you have a sort of a SimCity kind of table on one hand, you know, social mixing and then segregation, and you're trying to sort out like a computer game. And um, where the agency of uh, quote unquote the elderly are reduced to, yeah. you know, so I mean, is, there, is that itself a kind of politics of a kind of constructed narrative? which uh, is then linked to what Toshio uh, mentioned about the particular mayor and you said um, on how this is the kind of a pin in the bowling, you know, alley, the once you've got this, then you've got the regeneration for yeah. So some comments from your side on um, this form of construction of the data of the elderly of, of the space of this investment. I mean, is there, uh, can we rethink um, these kind of places in a completely different narrative and uh, really uh, substantially question the way uh, statistics data is all set up. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah, really yeah, yeah. set up like a sim city. Yeah, I know, uh, I know, I know. You know, yeah. gamification game, which is you know, Yeah. Um, so, okay. Uh, first, I want to say that it's still an ongoing research. Our next step will be to interview the elderly who are staying in the newly uh, renovated apartments. So we hope to get more <laughs> insights from them. Uh, what we have done instead for now is, uh, is that we also conducted interviews of the real estate uh, agents and the landlords. And they're pretty familiar with how the elderly are thinking, what they know their needs, because they actually take care of them. It's their clientele. If they don't put in the extra effort, they don't come in, basically. So. Uh, Okay, you can discuss whether it's a correct narrative or not, but uh, what I wanted to do now is that when you, when you interview the real estate agents, that uh, of course they have their own view on it, but it does seem a big issue that there's no young people over there. And it kind of gives it a, a sad image as well. I'm, I'm not saying that if we bring in young people that all the elderly will be happy. Probably not. But still, if we look around, and especially in my case because I'm a foreigner, and uh, I, we also interviewed uh, one German guest house resident. When we walk around there, <laughs> elderly get happy. <laughs> there is like a different person there, you know. And uh, also some of the Korean Residents, they said that elderly are very happy to talk to them, to learn about them. It's just having another face and, you know, some intergenerational contact. And, okay, I took this vantage point of it. Um, I know next step should be to get more uh, into touch with the elderly themselves and ask what they think about it. That I agree, though. Yeah. yeah. I, I have also one to ask actually about the, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, I also wanted to hear a little more about the elderly, but uh, he asked a question. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I was thinking about uh, the spatial mobility of the elderly. Like, uh, you know, like from Jackie's presentation, yeah. we got this idea that in Hong Kong they're actually quite mobile and that, that makes a big difference for them. Mm -hmm. so, uh, are the elderly here are more stranded almost in this neighborhood or not? And the second question is, I mean, this, this entire talk reminded me so much about how in European cities, there are attempts uh, by the governments, by the, by the urban administrations, to kind of um, uh, bring in the so-called natives into the ethnic neighborhoods, and like, mm -hmm. you know, right, uh, overcoming yeah. the ghetto situation. Yeah. Uh, is there something of a similar logic here? Are there different parts of the city, you know, like stigmatized by the homogeneous placement of a particular population? There, like you can compare to this case. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm first gonna reply you on the on the stigma thing. The complicated thing is the uh, Nishinari is stigmatized for its daily labor force. They're the marginal laborers. The second thing they're stigmatized for is it's uh, it's called burakumen. They have this social outcast system, old system, which still is uh, existing up until today. It has, it has very old roots, but I showed you in the beginning the public housing. Actually, they, there used to be squatter settlements before that, and then they, made the, and they built uh, public housing there because 
uh, these social outcasts, they had their own movement. They were pretty strong in the 60s and they had this housing demand uh, movement and they got their um, public housing. But how general Japanese society looks at it is they have this image of social outcasts as being dangerous people. Uh, there's still this stigma uh, problem there. And now you have yeah elderly problem. Uh, there's also quite a high rate of, of foreigners of of, pre of of Chinese people. They also had an old community of Korean people, but foreigners tend also to be connected to uh, crime and things like that. So it's actually stigmatized in many ways, the area. And because the city was thinking now uh, of of importing younger couples. I'm not sure if that's going <laughs> to go well. Yeah, if they give the tax incentives, if you give the tax benefits, okay, some of it will work. But yeah, I guess in this sense, it's social mixing as, as a management tool, you know, just in order to, uh, to counter the poverty existing there. If poverty exists, you know, a lot of NGOs will also get together and object to it. So it, it's one um, strategy, I would guess. I, I'm, what was the first uh, question again? I forgot. Elderly, yeah, a lot of elderly just stay in the area. Difference uh, of the frequency of public transportation for bus services. This area is only one one bus is one one hour. <laughs> so <laughs> social mobility is elderly because uh, we are also free. Over seventy years, older people can free can take a bus for free. But a bus service is not so many. So bicycle. A bicycle is very dangerous. Yeah, but uh, you have a lot of people. Yeah. You have a lot of people in wheelchairs. You have a, a lot of people with uh, physical disabilities as well. So, yeah, it's so mobility. Yeah. It's so high as in Hong Kong cases. Let's see. Uh, give me a second. I, I got. I think I got one. Picture. Yes. Yes. Jay, I think. I, I mean, I. I it's, it's very interesting. And I also like your idea of faith-based development, I mean, of faith, uh, huh? faith-based policy. Faith. Because we have, uh, in, you know, uh, in our area, we, we have something called faith-based development, kind of like pretty similar, I think, you know, like I, I just got a nice connection there. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, again, you know, like, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a designer and planning educator, so, so I would like to kind of like, rather than kind of like, I mean, one thing is trying to figure out what's there, but also kind of we need a little bit of imagination also, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so uh, the questions that I have is kind of like, you know, if, if the roads are too narrow for ambulances to go, why can't the ambulances be, be a little bit narrow? Why cannot? What? <laughs> ambulances be a little bit narrow, you know? I mean, is it is it the problem of the roads or is it the problem of the ambulance? You know? I mean, oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, or, the, or the fire trucks for that matter. Because, I mean, there are, there are actually really interesting innovations in certain Squatter uh, settlements in India, you know, like I mean, mm -hmm. where, where the NGOs have provided like uh, fire extinguishers, right, uh, in, in there. So, so I mean, is it should we be kind of like thinking like that? Should we be thinking like? I mean, I don't know. This yeah. Because, you know, I'm just uh, an outsider asking questions. And and you are talking about this district, you know, like I mean, where there's a particular demography. And do we really need to change the demography of the district, or can can the district be incorporated, you know, like around where where? The, the surrounding geography uh, 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 can, be, can be changed. Uh, and the other thing is kind of like, what is happening there? Because I mean, sometimes, you know, like, I mean, uh, in the United States, there are lots of post industrial cities, like, like they are really devastating. But, you know, like, it's, it's quite interesting for me, you know, like, when I go to, like, Flint, Michigan and so on, the first time I go there, it seems like, man, you know, like, I mean, it's all gone, but then there are, there's a liquor store. It seems like, man, it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. in addition to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Act, actually, it's not the case. Because in liquor store, it's because there's no, not enough uh, uh, market for for, for, uh, for grocery stores to come in. Therefore, the liquor store has become the grocery store. Mm -hmm. You can buy groceries at the liquor store. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there, are, there are, I mean, because the thing is, the, the, the first question you know, that I would ask is, like, what are people doing? Mm -hmm. What are they trying to do? Is, is there a way to kind of like pick up on that and sort of like enhance that and sort of like, you know, move Yeah. yeah. Um. Can I first an, uh, answer you on the, the fire trucks and the ambulance thing? Um, 
I think there are a lot of fire extinguishers uh, installed outside, but still, if you're with a very, if you're with an elderly population, I don't think elderly people are going to rush out and try to extinguish the fire. You know, you need some outside help. Uh, it's not, of course, it's not just whether the fact that they can pass or not. What we also notice is that many real estate agents and many of the landowners, they also um, try to keep an eye, eye out for uh, trouble. If they notice something, if they get a phone call, they, they rush to there and they try to do their own thing. People are doing something, but still, there are limitations to that, I guess. And especially if one of these houses would catch fire, the next one would catch fire immediately. And if you don't have a fire truck, I don't think you're going to just, you know, be able to extinguish it with just one fire uh, extinguisher um, for that fact. Um, the, whether the district can be incorporated into the city, do you mean that the district would be then like a specialized area for elderly no, people? Or change the district, I mean, the, the, the neighborhood itself. I mean, what about changing the surrounding neighborhoods? I'm just asking something. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, we've been working in the area, so we kind of think from the area. Um, I'm not sure how to connect it with the with the other areas. It, it's such a because you know it's the inner city. If you just go out the area, if you go up north, you're in the city center. It's a total different environment. If you go more south, it's also middle class, maybe a little bit lower class um, areas, but they don't have the, this crowded housing area problem. So I, I don't know. It, it, it kind of the problems there seem very locational, and I think there should be done something from that location out uh, first. Uh, and then last one, uh, what people, uh, let's see. How are people responding? What are they doing? What the people are doing? Yeah, I mean, is there anything that we can you know, capitalize on? That yeah, what we've been capitalizing on is, is what the real estate agents are doing, basically. Uh, oh yeah, for the grocery stores and places like that. Um, a lot of places are closing down, so my impression of it is we've, we are also doing many projects there, so there's backup from academia as well. Um, there are many cheap stores there, but they're all chain stores. It's not really the local uh, population. Another thing is that many people living there, they don't also feel comfortable living there. They don't really... Uh, one interesting thing is the real estate agent we had our interviews on, he has a brother and he's doing guest houses in other parts of uh, Osaka City. And why he's doing uh, guest houses in other parts of Osaka City is because he didn't like Nishinari. He wanted to move out as fast as possible. So you have also a population where it's just like, okay, this is not going to work out. I'm, I'm going to get out of here as fast as possible. So. It's, it's kind of diff difficult to pick up on, 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 on good practices there, I guess. Yeah. Uh, it's more common than a question, and it goes the same direction, like Nina uh, explained or asked. Um, if you put a guest house in a neighborhood, then I think it's very uh, logical that the, uh, rest, uh, the answer to the question why they do it. Uh, participate or integrate themselves in the mm -hmm. community because they are guests yeah, in, yeah. in the neighborhood. But I, uh, but you gave the you gave a good answer to my question <laughs> before because um, uh, reframing our our um, standpoints or our uh, perspectives because you explained that the people who are living in the neighborhood they uh, get in contact with the guests because they were asking, yeah, yeah, they were yeah. very happy about... Yeah, they're very uh, curious about yeah, them. Yeah. yeah, and I think maybe change change the mind and uh, find uh, these things and develop these things mm -hmm. yeah, that you can find. It's not the norm, yeah, 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 yeah. but maybe it's an advantage. Yeah, yeah.
somewhat of a rescheduling because uh, Kumanaka uh, will not come because his pain, his back pain problem. So, uh, so in the next session, we will have only one presentation by you. And then, uh, according to the schedule, we have another break. So may I suggest that we have, uh, you know, a slightly longer break, uh, just to, uh, you know, 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll move on to, to have three papers before dinner. Is that, is that fine? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So have coffee. <laughs> 20 minutes. Okay. 20 minutes.